welcome to the show, Catherine. It's a pleasure having you. And for everyone, this is oh sorry. This is Catherine Ahern. Sorry for the pronunciation. Okay, maybe I have to. No, that's uh -huh. right. Yeah. Catherine Ahern from Knowledge Futures Group. And um yeah, so let's let's hear from you, like basically how you got into the organization. We We've been working together because you're mostly in charges and stand with Papa. And we've been communicating and collaborating because Africa Archive is using Papa as one of our affiliated um, partner repository systems for making African research outputs um, more discoverable. Um, and yeah, and now we're moving the whole website where we can talk about that. Um, after we've heard more of you and where you're coming from and why you're working and what you're doing at the Knowledge Futures Group. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a big question. I think the answer starts many years ago. <laughs> um, so I, I actually started working, um, with Travis Rich, who's now our executive director, um, back in 2017 when we were really just working on PubPub. So PubPub, the product, precedes Knowledge Futures as an org. Um, but now it's situated as a product that KF um, helps and, you know, builds, helps to build. Um, and let's see, back then, Travis and I happened to graduate uh, at the same time, um, him from the MIT Media Lab. I did a PhD at BU in editorial studies. Um, I was feeling extremely burnt out after finishing that degree and basically took a summer to to travel and think about what I really wanted to do um, and saw that the pr MIT Press was um, becoming more involved in developing PubPub for books and journals and just long form content mm -hmm. um, and thought it sounded really interesting. I had started getting interested in the open sharing of information uh, during my PhD because I had to work a lot in archives and I was sort of appalled by how much is just locked up and inaccessible to people unless you have you know a big travel budget at your department or something that allows you to actually go in person and, and handle a lot of these materials. So um, I had already started kind of pulling on that thread a little bit and uh, yeah, it was really interested when I saw that there was potentially um, a role there to to help others do that as well. Mm -hmm. I should say too that at that point, as you can imagine, KF didn't even exist yet. So my job has actually looked very different year to year. Um, you know, since since then, and I've I've been part of KF for over five years now. At that point, my job was uh, I think my title was community manager for Pub Pub. Um, and it really just meant building any kind of community on the platform because there were, you know, a few groups on there. Um, and at that point you weren't able to create a community for yourself whenever you wanted to, like you can now. So everything went through us. Mm. Um, and then over the years, as we hired people, Gabe came on our head of product. Um, we had some more developers eventually now have a, a, a whole community team that I lead. Um, and then of course we created Knowledge Futures as the wrapper, it's the home org around Pub Pub. Um, things have changed a lot. Mm. Yeah, I remember, I think we said, well, I'm, I'm, I, I remember we started engaging in 2020, like mm. the uh, infamous pandemic that hit <laughs> <laughs> that one, yeah. So it's one of these few success stories that emerged from the disaster. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been really exciting to see you know Futures Group grow and with it pop up and also um to be amongst the can I still say early adopters of pop up? I think there were a few before us, but well obviously. But um also, like I think it's it's a good a good opportunity now with an audience and witnesses to express gratitude for the support you've given to us as a community with Africa. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, and just to see like how how easygoing it can be to work with an institution on infrastructure 
And um, I also admire the approach Knowledge Futures is taking and also Pub has been designed mm -hmm. from the onset with being community driven, very much responsive, um, also listening closely to what the community needs are. And also being edge and versatile to, yeah, to use digital systems and approaches to cater for different use cases. Um, as much Thank as you. I'm sure users also bring uses, use cases to you that you might have not even considered. Um, All the time. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we can talk about these for a few minutes. So what are your yeah. use cases? Or... Sure, no, I feel like you can do a better job of this than me. You should just keep talking. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, I think it, we do really uh, put a lot of effort into being community driven. That's how we build our roadmap. That's how we build our services that we offer. Um, it's really based on what we're hearing people want but also just like, like I said, anyone can create a community on Pub Hub at any time. And so there's a lot of stuff going on that we have no direct involvement in. And so my team gets together once a month and we, we call it Pub Club and we kind of go through new communities and we look at what people are doing and we, we are really mining for inspiration and for ideas. And um, sometimes we'll reach out and say, hey, this is really cool. <laughs> Uh, you know, we learned X, Y, Z about our own platform by looking at your community. So um, we really do put a lot of, of effort and really enjoy that part of it. Um, and, you know, we we do offer kind of expertise and services on, on how to use PubPub, but a lot of what we build on, a lot of those ideas are just really from combined from the community. Um like I mentioned earlier, you know, originally PubPub was used internally at the MIT Media Lab to help share research more iteratively in a more dynamic way. Groups there were finding that, you know, they just didn't work in the traditional model of like, you know, having a defined beginning and an end and being able to publish an article in a PDF that kind of fully captured everything that they were doing. Um, since then, you know, I think books and journals were the next kind of natural step. But even then we were trying to iterate and say, okay, well, this isn't just text on a screen. How do we really make something um, truly take advantage of being digital of first um, and, and really kind of integrate some of that multimedia, um, some of the interactives that we do now um, directly into how you even conceive of a project, not just how you communicate about it. So that has really taken, I think the projects on the platform and the platform itself into exciting directions. Um, and now we see lots of kind of iterative, uh, like evolving books, um, lots of open review conferences that will either live stream or publish their talks and posters and things for community annotation and, um, and indexing and archiving, you know, all on PubPub. And so, um, you know, we we kind of just try to keep track of what everyone's doing. And I think one of one of my favorite things, um, and I'll, I'll, I think Africa Archive is, is kind of a good example of this too, is that um, I love it when people start using PubPub for a thing, they're not really sure where, where, like, where it will go, or, you know, they have an initial use case, and then they're able to keep using it as their project evolves and takes on other forms or brings on other people or ideas. Um, I think the flexibility and elasticity of those spaces is really valuable because it kind of doesn't pigeonhole you into being a preprint archive or just a journal or just a single thing and need to then add on more platforms as you kind of naturally evolve your ideas and then who you work with. Yeah, and coming back to Africa, I got resided also or approached you in the first place because Hubbub was obviously well suited to host audiovisual content. And with the onset of the right. pandemic, we were really worried about um, like how African researchers could contribute to the knowledge building around how we could mitigate um, COVID 19 and its effects across disciplines, societal. Um, impact of the virus 
in across the continent and also to allow African researchers to contribute to the global knowledge base basically and um like our team were just really concerned with seeing everybody going into lockdown and knowing the difficulties in infrastructure also with the internet um in mo still most African regions um it's getting better by the day so that's good right. There's still also lack of capacity um, in wild areas mm -hmm. and, and also unstableness of the connectivity. Um, so we we co-drafted a, a preprint really in um, and we were also very much helping in, in the design and the conceptualization on how this can um, unfold and encouraging African scholars in particular, but also um, suggesting that as a blueprint for anyone to adopt how African researchers could share the knowledge in audio or video, just to their mobile phones for the lack of yeah. um, research equipment or computers that are usually in the lab or laptops that they may or may not have. Um, I mean, certainly many do have laptops and um, advanced gear sets, but just for the ease of contributing mm -hmm. to the knowledge um, exchange. And the adoption of that yeah. um, suggestion wasn't wasn't huge, but yeah, I, I mean it was. Specific. But it was, but it was a good idea, and it was creative. Like I remember, so KF became its own. We got our five hundred one c three certification in March of twenty twenty, <laughs> um, and that really could have gone either way for us. But I remember hearing about this project, and we, you know, we got proposals for a few to help out with a few other projects as well that were pandemic related or. Um, you know, adjacent, trying to help with with the global crisis. And um, we were really inspired by that. I think, you know, we, we often try to put pressure on what quote unquote legitimate forms of knowledge communication look like. I think what, you know, what's kind of tacitly um, being argued on platforms like PubPub is that things don't have to look a certain way um, to matter and to, to be effective. Oftentimes, a journal article is not the most effective way of communicating um, what you know, um, and and so, you know, again, even though you know we had hoped for more uptake in that idea, I think the fact that you can experiment with it, there's open infrastructure that like lowers the barrier on the, and the cost of trying it. Um, and then there's that idea out there and that model that other people can replicate for themselves. And it's, you know, it's not to say that it wouldn't be really successful um, in a different context. And so I think, you know, we also try to have a similar mindset when we're developing, say, a feature with a specific community or partner in mind. We immediately make it available for free for everybody using the platform because, Oftentimes, and you know, two weeks later, we'll see someone use it or implement it in a way we hadn't even thought of when mm -hmm. we were building it. And I think that that kind of um, the ability for communities to experiment and then learn from each other, and you know, kind of take the baton and and go the other the extra mile with an idea is like really promising and just makes me really excited. Mm. And also the fact that we publish as a preprint, sometimes the time is just not ready. Or when the invention sees the light of day, um, mm -hmm. and it might still be worthwhile to consider for future scenarios. Yeah, um, and also helped us to streamline communication and to also step into new ventures that also um, the other products of knowledge future um, develops, like to blur the line between what's we had this conversation the other day in the partners meeting instead of kind of thing. Um, blurring the line between gray literature, or what's usually referred to as gray literature and yeah. sophisticated, whatever that means, um quality literature. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and I think like what bothers me most lately is also there's so much conversation around um when it comes to scholarly publishing. Like and it's most often ends with now it's published which way which which right. usually the journal article way and we try to loosen that up but the conversation usually ends with the publishing part but isn't it with open science we want to ensure that the research findings 
reach societal levels and are accessible for societal stakeholders explicitly outside academia. And for that, the open access alone is not enough. We also need translation into other languages and I'm not referring, might come to talk about that because it's also a um, hot topic and a passion project or something. Yeah. Multilingualism, but um, um, like languages that other communities can understand, the, the general public, the industry leaders and stakeholders, the nonprofit sector, they don't speak academic. So let's let's maybe dive a little bit into the other products um, besides PubPub that Merge Futures Group is currently being developing and already hosting and sure. In, yeah. Yeah, and, and fostering that knowledge exchange. And how well, by, by way of kind of pivoting to the other stuff too, I, I'll just say that mm -hmm. as an org, we've really honed in on this notion of effectiveness, of trying to help the people who use our products reach their goals, fulfill their missions more effectively. Um, we had a really good conversation with a criminologist um, at this point, it was probably about a year ago or more, but, um, you know, we said, well, what, like, what's your pie in the sky results, right, of, of sharing your research and information? And it's, for most people, it's not that, you, you know, you publish something, right? Like, that's, that has to do with, with tenure, promotion, with your mm -hmm. career, which is not to say that's not important, but it's often not the point itself of, mm -hmm. of the work you're doing. Um, and they were like, well, I want to influence like police policy, like I want police, you know, departments to be able to use my work and and decide and make decisions and and do their jobs better. And we're like, okay, like let's work to that. Let's work for mm -hmm. that, you know. And so when we're when we're thinking about products to build, um, and and I should say part of why we created Knowledge Futures is because we realized, well, PubHub alone, an open publishing platform alone it's great, but it's not going, and it's not alone going to really influence the kind of changes we want to see in um, the academic publishing scholarly communications spaces. Um, and so we are also working on and we'll be rolling out um, just a, a platform for open uh, data communication so that people can share um, their data sets more effectively again. Um, so that people can actually use <laughs> shared open data, build mm -hmm. upon it, grow communities around it. We learned a lot from building PubPub around a community model. And I think when that rolls out, people will see um, some good similarities there. Mm -hmm. um, another another product that we have is called Commonplace. It's itself a kind of publication. Um, but to us, that's sort of the cultural arm of what we do, right? It's it's the acknowledgement that just because we build things doesn't mean people will come and use them. We really do need to be a part of the conversation and a part of evolving the cultures and ideas that really kind of move people to use them, um, to change their behaviors and to think more creatively mm -hmm. about how they share, um, you know, what they're working on. Um, so we're, we're really kind of focusing on those three things, but then there are other projects that we're involved in with partners as well. And okay, so let's dig in maybe briefly into the data sharing. Um, so what when you say it will be more versatile or more engaging also for other stakeholders as a academia, how, can you already sh um, yeah share how that's going to be achieved? Compared to sure, I mean, I can. I'm not on the underlay team, so I'll do. Uh, I'll do my best in doing this justice, but um, I think you know what what we've seen. So what we've seen with PubHub again as sort of the model for our like development and bringing in communities to um, mm -hmm. test, inform, and help us develop projects is that um, you know initially you had to work through us um, so to publish anything on PubHub. So. I think for this next year, at least, we'll be working with some specific communities that we've already kind of talked to. Um, it won't be, underlay won't be something that anyone can just sign up for with a click of a button like you can for PubPub. Um, and we'll be working really closely with them to 
see how they're using it and iterate and, and kind of build out the, the UI for underlay um, before we kind of give everybody <laughs> the mm -hmm. keys. Um, but the idea is that you can you can publish a data set um, and you know define basically the um, like the fields and, and terms of, of the data, what they mean, um, and openly kind of track your your changes, your the evolution of that data. People can then like fork it or suggest updates based on what they're doing. You can actually see how other people, are using it. Um, so it's not just that you publish mm. kind of, you know, your your data or that you have a statement saying, get in touch with us. And you know, that rarely goes anywhere. Um, oftentimes they're, you know, I, I see people complaining on Twitter all the time that they can't access what should be open data. Mm. So it's really meant to to create like a more collaborative, transparent interface for sharing your data and inviting other people to use it and inviting other people to contribute to it. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Also, um, considering like it was just recently that somebody had struck me that um, as much as it's often recommended to share data under CC zero, like public domain, just to mm -hmm. make it adaptable in whichever context. But then, which data set mm -hmm. is clean enough and contextualized enough to not right. possibly end up in a harmful way? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so data ownership. So as much as many institutions and individuals push for data being published in the public domain to make it um, reusable as widely as ever possible. And that, like, I, I also bought into that first, but especially in an African context, it's, for me, like, suddenly it struck me that that's an invitation to another form of misappropriation and recolonization of whatever research data is coming out of the continent. And it might just be as harmful for other projects in other world regions or in whichever context. Um, first, because hardly any data set is contextualized um, enough to avoid any misinterpretation of the data, um, or I, I, I've yet to, to see those. Um, I think it's possible, but it's, yeah, I think it, it it requires a lot of information to avoid that from happening. But in the model that yeah. you just laid out, um, anything can be traced. So misappropriation can easily be detected that way and also called out for. Um, and probably also prevented. If so, yeah. I'm sure that CC by SA share alike would be a way forward for Africa with the current systems. But given that we adopt uh tracing system or track changes system like the underlay is now developing. Maybe that's another alternative that can be functional and no, I, I think that's a good point. It it is a nuanced thing. And even here in the US, um, the White House uh Office of Science and Technology Policy just issued some guidelines um to open up uh publications and data that receive public funding mm -hmm. um and you know even you know yes that in and of itself sounds like a great thing we are supportive of that um and then there's all the nuance that goes into actually what that looks like in in practice um i was talking to a friend the other day who's a, a pediatrician she does research and they're now trying to comply with this new policy and and knows that i'm interested in this stuff and so text me to complain a little bit about um, a lot of the um, like logistical implications and the costs, um, even of just, um, you know, working to make some of that data anonymous so that they can publish it openly and, and the time it takes to do that. Um, increased APCs because there are few incentives built into the policy that will actually change publishing behavior. Um, instead, it just means more, more money goes toward kind of unlocking articles um, using APCs. So there's there's a lot, there's a lot to, to work on. Um, but I do still think that these pushes, whether it's government policy or cultural shifts are, are still kind of pushing us in the right direction. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's like to open up is good and the cautiousness is necessary. But I think we're also mature enough as a society, not only in academia, 
Hopefully so. I don't know. To have enough watchdogs to make sure that we don't yeah, screw this up. Yeah. I mean it's watchdogs, but it's also just like perspectives in the room, right? So knowledge features is partially sustained, hopefully one day mostly sustained by memberships. Hmm. Um and our, our members range from like whole foundations like the Gates Foundation to you know, societies to publishing houses, but also individuals <laughs> like mm -hmm. who just want to be, uh, you know, support open infrastructure and be a part of the conversation. And so even, you know, just this week, we we emailed people about being a part of, um, you know, the process of developing a new feature we're, we're going to be building this year and having, you know, the director of a press in that Zoom call with our dev team alongside just like, you know, someone in Switzerland who's supportive of our work like that's a really that's good that's you know and we we can do a better job of having a broader um, spectrum of, of groups and people in our membership list that's always something we're trying to do but um, I think just having um, making sure we have a multiplicity of of perspectives while we're building infrastructure is really important mm -hmm. Right. And now coming to the third product or the second really in the pipeline, um, since the underlay is still to be launched. Um, mm -hmm. so the commonplace, um, I've I've read a bit back and forth and in the past and I found like highly informative thought leadership pieces there. Thank you. So and and also by colleagues of of or that I know from either directly collaborating with or from the research literature. Mm -hmm. So one question would be technically, so why, what what would be the decision to publish on the commonplace versus Papa as a, like, is the commonplace also indexed with, um, through Crossrail for the scholarly databases? Um, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I mean, well, we use, we use Papa to publish commonplace. So <laughs> it'd be funny if we didn't. <laughs> so, uh, we do we do consider it you know a bit of a sandbox for our team because it's one you know another place where we're also using our own product mm -hmm. um, we have a few of those and I think that um, you know when we roll out submission and review we were one of the first publications to actually use it and so we give that feedback to our dev team just like anybody else would um, so, so yeah, we, we use, we use pub up to publish commonplace, um, from the outset, we were very, um, clear that it should not just be a place where our own team and, and leadership publishes their thoughts, right? This is not a publication that's just about what Knowledge Futures is doing. I think we actually only have like three or four pieces penned by, penned. Uh, written by by someone on our team. So it's really meant to um, highlight and amplify the work that groups are doing um, that we're learning from, that we think other people can learn from. Um, and that just, again, sort of push the space in the right direction. That's cool. Oh, and the other question uh, just slipped in my mind. Mm -hmm. and yeah, no, what's the variety of um, topics or also stakeholder groups that you see embracing commonplace to share their thoughts? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So we actually just pushed up some uh, a new mission and some some updates on commonplace. Um, and I'm I'm happy to share that link. Um, and we're we're also going to start paying contributors in 2023. We we got the budget for that. So that's a huge, huge step in the right direction for us. Um, but I think initially and now, um, we've seen a lot of interest from librarians, um, scholarly communications, researchers, um, you know, whether they, they sit within a department or within a library, mm -hmm. um, and honestly, both like early career and, and some, some tenured, um, researchers, faculty, um, that are kind of, again, mission aligned and, and thinking similarly. So it's been a range, um, but I would say that historically librarians or people kind of in that space have been um, the first to sort of 
find <laughs> find themselves within commonplace, um, which which we love. Um, and I, I I also think it's a, a similar. We mm -hmm. found some similar kinship on Pub Pub as well with with those groups. Yeah, coming like coming from a researcher's perspective, so, so when we launched Africa Archive, I've mm -hmm. only learned through that work how librarians think about open science, and we basically do the same thing, but with different approaches and different uh, taxonomies sometimes, yeah. and it's highly confusing. So I feel like it, I, I really appreciate that in Commonplace and also elsewhere, um, librarians get a voice to express themselves because mm -hmm. they have such rich knowledge about yeah anything from scientometrics, bibliometrics, publishing workflows, best practices, university presses, engagement, all of that. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think, think, you know, we we enjoy hearing, and this is relevant to Commonplace, but really just like for any product that we're working on, we we sometimes like to say that we're we're not necessarily trying to make the system that exists better or more efficient, although if that's a side effect, great. I think we are trying to bring about like new systems. Um, you know, like we're not trying to make it easier for people to pay APCs. Like we, we, we don't think that's the right model. Um, and so finding, you know, working with people and, and honestly, people are very good at finding us. Um, we have no marketing team. We have no sales team. We've done no proactive outreach. And I, that's something we do plan on doing um, in the near future, if not this year. Um, but so far, um, you know, we have been able to communicate clearly enough about what we're doing and why mm. um, we've been able to rely on people who have already found us and, and have done cool things to tell other people. Um, and we've grown that way. But um, yeah, I think we, we want to use Commonplace to try to connect better with fellow travelers and to really shine a light on what it is that they're doing too. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, also being mindful of the time, I hope we'll be able to continue this con um, conversation and discussion um, some other time um, to explore, maybe after the underlay has been launched, also to wider adoption. Yeah. Um, and yeah, again, like it's a pleasure working together and um, thanks for making time for this. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Of course. Thanks for the invite. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah. So any last words? Uh, yeah. Okay. I think we can any do. final <laughs> words. <laughs> I always find it difficult to close this, but uh, no, <laughs> it's an ongoing story. So the, the, the conversation is to be continued for sure. So I come back anytime and um yeah there's more to explore yeah thank you for having me mm -hmm.